everybody, it's Tyler here at the Ontario Provincials checking in Alpha Dogs 4946. This is a team I'm telling you right now, if you are not from Ontario, you really need to start paying attention to this team. This is a gorgeous robot, and guess what? They actually have two robots. So let's learn more about the Alpha Dogs on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to Animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions. Support Fun's content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and Fun members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the Join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Chris, let's talk about the mechanical features of the robot. Starting out, we gotta talk about your drive. You're doing some custom TPU wheels, a little bit uh, custom on the swerve, and then we'll be going into your note journey as well. Hi, so starting off with the Swerve, this year we're running SDS MK4i modules, and we also have a L4 Plus gearing on there with an 18 tooth pinion. So that's pretty cool this year that we're really fast with our low weight of about 100 pounds. Moving on to here, we have the intake. So we have a tri-roller intake right here that's geared down to a reduction of three to one. So that's pretty cool. And we wanted to make sure with our iterations that we could intake while we were moving on the fly. That'd make our intaking really quick. So we wanted to make sure we have a full intake that covers the length of our robot. So we made sure we have these uh, idle rollers right here that center the notes into the center of the robot. So that makes it really easy that we prevent jamming problems. Walk me through how your uh, trap mechanism works uh, overall. Like I love the little duck things, but can we bring that up and actually see how that works? Yeah, so our trap mech just comes up like this. The bear goes down. Yeah, with the note right in there. Uh, we've got a bigger wheel on the top here and a smaller wheel on the bottom, so the note it naturally wants to come down into the trap. Uh, and we've got two points here that we kind of call the uh, beaks or the duck uh, that hold the door open uh, just enough for this note to slip right in. Uh, and we use the the, uh, the line brake sensor here to make sure that we're getting in every time. And then at the very end, we just pull the arm back just to make sure that we're counting that climb at the end. Very cool, Matt. Um, and then the other thing I want to ask you uh, in regards to uh, your uh, climb, if we can uh, uh, actually showcase that because your climb, I love how just like light and simple it is in regards to when we were talking earlier, you just kind of slapped it on and said, hey, like this is a system that's just super easy, doesn't weigh a whole lot and it works. So talk to me more about that. Uh, yeah, so we uh, iterated a lot with the climb. So first we wanted to start off with uh, chains, but the chains, didn't, the chains were too heavy and they didn't work out for us. So we uh, moved to the belts and we had these. Uh... Okay. Yep. So we have these special uh, 3D printed parts right here. And also we have these brackets right here to uh, help us uh, grab onto the chain and have a lot of height right here. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a great design overall. Um, you know, and one of the things I love is just overall your manufacturing that you've done for that. How do you approach your manufacturing process? Because this is just a gorgeous robot overall. Yeah. So we actually have a CNC in-house. So a lot of our manufacturing is done on the milling machine lates in the CNCs. So that's pretty cool. Luca, talk to me about the uh, shooter on your robot. Uh, and how that's gone through. This whole carriage assembly that you have is really slick on it. Uh, but when we were talking earlier, there's a lot of thought process that went into uh, your compression and your wheels and a little bit of offset as well too. Talk to me more about that. Yeah, so uh, immediately we tried to prototype a lot at the start of the season, trying different side rollers and uh, top and bottom rollers. Uh, and we found that the best combination that we could, uh, could get was by applying some level of spin onto the shooter. Uh, so we got two sets of wheels here on the shooter. Uh, one is green, one's black. These have two different types of compression. So these side, this side's softer, this side's a little bit harder. So this naturally has, you know, put some spin onto the note. Uh, and each shaft is actually angled because we're using polycarb on the shooter, uh, just about a degree. So it just applies even more uh, spin onto those notes. So we can shoot pretty far, pretty reliably, uh, and pretty straight and consistent. Uh, in terms of the shooter angle, it's actually rotated from the front. We tried to keep our center of gravity as balanced as possible, especially when it came to the shooter, so it didn't take as much power uh, to actually move it around. Uh, I'm just gonna try and enable here. Just intake. Yeah, so it just moves around, uh, and then we've got a camera on the front here uh, that reads the April tags to calculate our distance to the, uh, the goal uh, and sets the barrel appropriately. Well, we found out pretty early on in the season, uh, after a couple quick prototypes, that we could actually amp with our shooter, which changed a lot of our trap scoring designs. 
Uh, so if you just want to show that. So now it just pops out just like that. Um, our shooter is controlled separately, the top and bottom. So this allows us to have a faster speed on the bottom and a slower speed on the top, which is how it kind of glides in uh, when we're amping. So there's nothing that's actually like rebalancing that note or re-angling the note or anything like that when it goes in. You just have the right angle and it's able to get in? Yep. That's really cool. That's a lot of, you know, I think about uh, when we did stuff with Cranberry Alarm, that's something we really struggled with a lot in Robot in three days. So it's really cool to see that your team has figured out how to do that so well. And yep. um, they're really cool with that. Uh, how about uh, software side of things? Uh, you mentioned a little bit with the uh, camera, but anything else that you want to uh, run down or break through from your software controls? Yeah, so like Chris said, we've got a multitude of sensors on our robot that helps make the driver's life uh, a lot easier and makes our autos a lot easier. Uh, so we've got four sets of line brakes across the robot. One's on the intake. Uh, and this is used in Teleop just to alert the driver by blinking the LEDs so we can move pretty much as fast as he can away from that source, uh, as well as moving uh, to the midline in auto to, so we can get away from there and avoid any big hits. Uh, we have a line break on the duck here, which, like I said earlier, is how we are able to feed our uh, trap mechanism. Uh, and it's also how we're able to hold two notes uh, if we really wanted to in the source to really maximize our amplification cycles. And then in the shooter, we've got two. Uh, one's at the very bottom of the feeder, one's at the very top. Uh, and this is used to make sure the note ends up in a reliable spot every time with just a little bit of hold on the feeder here and right before the shooter. So it's not getting shot out early uh, and it's staying roughly the same compression level the whole time. All right, we got to bring up uh, the dog in the room here and that is the other robot that your team has. Your team is fielding two robots. Yep. This is nuts, by the way. Like this is like old school Tyler Boomer thing that uh, you would see out there. Talk to me about this second. How did you even build this and how is it even legal? Yeah, so I've got to stop you right there. Uh, it's actually not two robots. This is two configurations All right. of the same robot. Uh, this is more like a collection of spare parts. So early on in the season, we wanted a big focus of being fast. So we could beat every robot to the middle line and just really maximize our cycles everywhere. Uh, and this started with a lot of weight loss on the uh, main robot, main configuration, uh, before we eventually realized uh, that the trap isn't really worth it after uh, playoff, uh, after qualification matches. And when it comes to E-limbs, the, uh, the more cycles you can do, the better which led to this kind of joke design at first where we completely removed our trap mechanism, shrunk it down, uh, and this weighs about 40 pounds uh, without swerve modules, and it's pretty much a smaller version of this. So we've got a smaller intake, but otherwise it's pretty much identical with centering wheels and a sensor there, uh, so no duck, and then it just feeds right into the shooter. Uh, and <laughs> another joke that we had was if we were able to climb with this thing, and we just decided to put claws on top of the barrel, uh, and these can just barely grab the chain and pull us down. Uh, and otherwise it runs pretty much identical software uh, and is a lot faster and uh, more nimble based on our tests. So how does this work? If you want to actually put this in, what changes need to be made in order to deploy this uh, uh, second set of parts or yeah. whatever bureaucratic words you're using? Absolutely. So a, a robot is defined as a, a collection of electromechanical parts with a drivetrain on it. And a drivetrain is defined as something with gears, belts, and motors uh, and wheels. Uh, and this configuration, when we take off our modules, uh, thanks to the very handiness and modularity of Swerve modules these days, uh, no longer is considered a robot and is simply just a collection of spare parts. As soon as we put on these modules, uh, it becomes a robot. So when we want to use this at a competition, we have to take off all the modules uh, on this main robot first and then put them onto this one. Once that's happened, we have one robot once again. Okay, so sincere question, are we gonna see this deployed uh, in the field? Is it gonna happen? Yeah, we put in a lot of work throughout the whole season trying to catch it up to this main robot. We've had a lot of issues with CAN and uh, a handful of other things. Uh, but in the last couple of days, our programming team has worked really hard to uh, kind of get close to the same level of autos. And uh, our teleop is definitely a lot faster on this small robot. So we're really hoping to use it in uh, playoffs like our original plan was. Well, Alpha Dogs, this is phenomenal. Uh, thank you so much for showcasing your two sets of parts that you have uh, overall. But incredible work so far this year. We can't wait to see how you do here at Provincials and hope to see you at the World Championships as well, too. Thanks for a lot of taking time and good luck the rest of the way. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your robotics competition needs. Celebrating 20 years of quality robotics parts and superior service, Animark employees have over 200 years of first-team experience. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to animark.com for high-quality and affordable solutions.